Eric is the man behind AtlanteanConspiracy.com and the author of a big conspiracy encyclopedia by the same name, covering everything from Atlantis to Zion. He's also more recently finished a book and documentary pair, both entitled The Flat Earth Conspiracy, a guy that has definitely challenged my worldview, and that's not an easy thing these days, so let's dive into it. Eric, my man, welcome to THC. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate it. So happy to have you here, man. And I think a lot of people are going to be challenged with this one. And it is going to be tough to articulate some of these arguments without pictures and diagrams. But what I've seen has raised some serious red flags with a lot of things that we take as a given. Everything from the existence of nuclear weapons in the International Space Station to the makeup of the Earth and the entire universe itself. So let's not beat around the bush, man. You know, to challenge the heliocentric model of the solar system is pretty blasphemous in today's world. So how do we start to unravel some of this stuff? What are some of the biggest red flags with our traditional understanding that should start putting those first cracks in the listener's preconceived notions? Sure. Well, just our common sense, everyday perception of the Earth, it is flat as far as we can tell. Uh, It is motionless as far as we can tell. And everything in the sky is revolving around us as far as we can tell. If nobody told us otherwise, we'd logically assume that the Earth was flat, motionless, with everything in the sky revolving around us. And you can prove that this is the case as well, for instance, with the horizon. As you rise up, no matter how high you go on the top of Mount Everest, or if you go in a balloon higher and higher, as far as 20 miles up and higher, we've gotten independent balloons have gone up with cameras. The horizon remains flat all the way around and rises to the eye of the camera all the way up. Now, if the Earth were a ball, no matter how big, the horizon is said to be the curvature of the ball. So as you rose up, the horizon would stay where it, uh, where it was, and you'd have to look down if you're in a hot air balloon, down further and further as you rose up and up, and the horizon would be below you. But in fact, as high as any non-NASA, RASA, or other Freemasonic space agency has ever shown us, as far as any independent camera has ever gone up with an independent rocket or a balloon, as far as 20 miles uh, up, totally flat and rises to the eye of the observer. So that's one proof. Of course, you can measure uh, curvature if it actually existed. They say the ball Earth is 25,000 miles in circumference, and using spherical trigonometry, it figures out to 8 inches of curvature per mile squared. The mile is squared, so for 2 miles, it would be 2 times 2, 4 times 8 inches, 32 inches. And for the third mile, it's 3 squared, which is 3 times 3, 9 times 8 is 72. So you're going 8, 32, 72, 128 inches, and so on. And this is the kind of curvature that would exist on a ball, and specifically on a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, as they say it is. So you can check with theodolites and telescopes and different methods, lasers, to see if the Earth actually does have that curvature. And it's been tested over and over again and found to have no curvature whatsoever. So, I mean, even if they had the number wrong and it was uh, 100,000 miles in circumference, there would still be a calculable, measurable curvature that just isn't there. What you're seeing here is a mirage. The only place curvature exists is in NASA photos and videos, and those can be proven to be CGI fakes, and the early ones were literally taken through a round window to make the Earth appear round. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr., and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind-the-scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. 
Um, and that's it. It's just photo trickery and brainwashing that's got the world thinking that we're on a ball spinning around the sun with a magical force called gravity holding us on the underside of this spinning ball. Uh, it's all just brainwashing that we've received. It's pseudoscience accepted as, as legit science. But real science has confirmed geocentricity in the flat earth for thousands of years. The flat earth was, was known to ancient cultures all over the world for thousands of years. And it's actually a relatively recent phenomenon that people have been believing we're on a big ball spinning around the sun. Pythagoras first came up with it about 2,500 years ago. He's also often considered the first Freemason. And uh, it didn't go anywhere much from there until 2,000 years later, Copernicus picked up where he left off, another Jesuit Freemason. and. Uh, he really picked things up, and Kepler, and Galileo, and Newton, and now Einstein, and NASA, Sagan, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, and all these people, they're, they're all part of this Freemasonic club that is building a pseudo-scientific worldview to indoctrinate the slave class so that we can be propagandized into doing anything. This is basically the biggest thing you could possibly lie about. So the psychopaths who control society are, and are interested in world domination. The best way to brainwash the whole world is to lie to the whole world about what the world is. What is the earth under your feet? What is in the sky above your head? Uh, where did we come from? You know, it, it's now this lie has now evolved into a big bang evolution, heliocentric spinning ball cosmology. When in reality, we're, we're not uh, a cosmic accidental sneeze, uh, nothingness turned everything. This is quite obviously intelligently designed, this, this thing we're experiencing here, this life, this universe. Uh, I, I can't believe anyone in their right mind can look me in the eyes with a straight face and say, no man, it's all random. This is all just random, <laughs> uh, but people do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I think you make a lot of great points, man. And I think the curvature argument is pretty damn strong. And I pulled this off your website in the comments section because, to your credit, you spend a lot of time writing thorough answers to questions and responses to critics. And that's where a lot of my questions got answered. And so here's a little more detail about the curvature argument from your site. It seems like lighthouses are one great example. This first one you have is the Isle of Wight Lighthouse in England. It's 180 feet high and can be seen up to 42 miles away, a distance at which modern astronomers say the light should fall 996 feet below the line of sight. Why can you still see it? And then you have several other good examples in the lighthouse department, but another one worth mentioning that people be familiar with is the Statue of Liberty. It stands 326 feet above sea level, and on a clear day it can be seen as far as 60 miles away. Now, if the Earth was a globe at the dimensions that they give us, that would put Lady Liberty at an impossible 2,074 feet below the horizon. These examples seem hard to rectify unless there's some obvious answer that I'm missing, but I would say this is a pretty compelling thread of evidence, my man. Yeah, yeah but the distance at which the light from lighthouses can be seen at sea uh, is just way too far for the Earth to be a ball 25,000 miles in circumference. Uh, another great example is the Notre Dame Antwerp spire standing 403 feet high from the foot of the tower with Strasbourg measuring 468 feet above sea level. And so with the aid of a telescope, ships can be seen on the horizon and captains declare they can see the spiral spire from an amazing 150 miles away. If the earth were a globe, however, at that distance, the spire should be an entire mile, 5,280 feet below the horizon. So there's a lot of examples like this where you've got a whole mile, say, that the light should be below the horizon. You should not be able to see it. And even uh, light refraction that the naysayers try to bring up can't account for it as it can only uh, account for one twelfth of whatever the original distance is. So, um, yeah, the light at which uh, lighthouses can be seen at sea, as well as the fact that uh, canals, tunnels, and railroads are never built with curvature in mind whatsoever. That's not necessary. And if there were, then the, their plans would be off, in fact. I've got quotes in my book from railroad engineers and canal builders saying how <laughs> it's absolutely, it's hard enough for railroads to turn, make 
curves uh, horizontally, let alone if we were on a ball and railroads would have to be curving up on the ball. And they give examples of different railroads over the earth and how long they are and how much curvature they'd have to be ascending and how it would be so impossible for the trains to, to be able to go up this curve because trains are made to be on a level. They just can't, they just can't operate that way. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of proofs like that. You mentioned uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and one compelling thing you have in your documentary is Neil deGrasse Tyson is on TV and he's talking about the shape of the earth and he's talking about how they just discovered now that the earth is more pear-shaped than it is round. So earth throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. It's an it's oblate and officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, we've been seeing pictures of the Earth from space, and it's a perfect circle. So either you don't know what you're talking about, or those pictures aren't real. Uh, this is a serious disconnect that's hard to rectify, Neil. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And they, they've said that it's a sphere, and then they've said that it's an oblate spheroid flattened at the poles, so it's kind of like smushed. And now more recently they're saying it's an oblate spheroid flattened at the poles with a bulge in the south, so it's kind of pear-shaped. Uh, so they keep changing it, but you're right, the, the pictures that they've given us, they show a perfect circle. Uh, they don't show uh, any sort of bulge or oblateness as they claim exists. Uh, and, and people say, oh, well, it's, it's just not enough to be seen. But uh, they're claiming it's quite a bit. He said it's uh, the amount of Everest above sea level is how much more oblate it is, supposedly. Right. You would think that would show up in the pictures. <laughs> now, a lot of people's first question is going to be, well, where's the edge? And I was surprised to uh, see how easy that is to rectify. But it, I'm sure you get that a lot. How do you tell people when they come at you with, well, where's the edge? Why aren't people sailing off the edge or whatever? So in the flat earth model, the North Pole is in the middle and the earth is a disk shape and the Antarctica is all the way around holding the oceans in. And so it's a fact if you're at the North Pole and you go south, no matter which uh, actually, it doesn't matter where you are. If you go south, eventually, you're going to end up in Antarctica. But on the ball model, it's just a little ice continent underneath the ball. Yet in this model, it's all the way around you, holding the oceans in. As for whether there's an edge beyond the Antarctic ice plateau, this wall that holds everything in is about 100 to 200 feet tall. And once you climb up on the ice wall, it's a plateau of snow that just goes on and on and on. Uh, and the public and myself are ignorant at the moment as to whether it, there is an edge at some point, whether there'd be a barrier, a dome, uh, as many ancient cultures have said there is, or whether it's an infinite flat plane and it's just snow, ice, wind, and darkness forever. So that's still a mystery uh, how the ice actually terminates, but it, it is a fact that if you travel south from anywhere on Earth, you will end up at the Antarctic ice wall. Um, the lie is that there's a south pole, and they've put a ceremonial red and white barbershop pole with a ball earth on top of it at an arbitrary point along the Antarctic ice. And they even admit that it's not the actual south pole, and they have this complex model how the north and south poles on the ball earth are constantly moving because of the, the nature of the uh, magnetic molten magnetic core of the ball earth they claim exists. Uh, but the real thing, real reason is they have guided tours there to the South Pole. And if you took a compass and you stood at their ceremonial pole, you should be able to walk in a circle and north would be in every direction. But of course that wouldn't happen. And so they'd have to answer to all these tourists every year as to why the South Pole clearly isn't the South Pole. And they even admit it, you can see on YouTube and they give their complex answer as to why it's always moving and you can never really find it. Same with the North Pole. In fact, if you watch North Pole documentaries, they always claim they're at the North Pole, but they're only showing a Garmin with 90 degrees north latitude. They never pull out a compass to actually check if they're at the North Pole. They're just on some ice somewhere, it could be anywhere on Earth, and then they're like, three feet, two feet, one feet, we're at the North Pole. And Twelve, ten, 
Oh, oh, top of the world, guys. Top of the world. We'll get that in a minute, Jake. It's just some random ice, you know, nothing in this. So, yeah, it's, it's easy to lie about these things. And these no man's lands, the North Pole and the Antarctica, they don't allow us to independently explore them. So people like Rodney Clough or Jarl Andehoy, independent explorers who've wanted to go to the North Pole and Antarctica without getting government pre-approval and only going with their escorts to the uh, places they want you to go. They've actually been turned around at gunpoint by military vessels not allowing them to go in. Jarl Andehoy's faced jail time and uh, fines for it as well. So uh, they definitely don't want us exploring what is in the, uh, the middle of the flat earth and on the edges. They keep us in the middle. Yeah, I find it really interesting. And the first thing I had thought when I was getting into this is like, well, what about airplanes? You know, people fly from North America to China to Europe all around the globe or, you know, the proposed globe. And this is easy to rectify with the model you laid out with the North Pole in the center. When you fly, if you think about the rings on a bullseye, you can fly around very, it can make it seem like you're going around a ball, but you're really just going around in a circular pattern on a flat plane. And I was like, wow, uh, I never really thought about it like that. And if you look at, well, of course, you know, something we always talk about is hidden in plain sight, symbolisms and corporate logos that they use. And if you look at the UN flag, this is exactly the model you're proposing. And it even has an overlay a gri of uh, like a bullseye pattern that shows you the overlay is exactly how planes would fly around or how ships would navigate around. But it's really odd that the UN flag would take up the exact same composition or damn close to the flat earth model. Yeah, the, the UN flag is a flat earth map. You can look at it. It is not a ball earth. It's a flat earth. And the bullseye you're talking about that's over it, if you, uh, if you, count the number of holes they've got there in the bullseye, there's exactly 33. So what they've got is a flat earth divided into 33 sections. And I'm sure you're aware that 33 is a significant occult number, especially among the Freemasons, who are the ones in charge of this whole deception, as I said, from all the way back to Pythagoras, the first Freemason who thought up this ball earth theory through Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and uh, right up to today, Neil deGrasse Tyson, etc. Uh, so the, the Freemasons in the UN, the Freemasons in NASA, these are the people who are doing this and uh, they put their symbology right out there by having the UN flag be a flat earth divided into 33 sections right in our face. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, they laugh about the flat earth. It's got to be the most ridiculed position ever. And you got to think there's a reason for that. Why, why is the, the concept of flat earth or being a flat earther so ridiculed? I have a, a flat earth comedy special I made, and you can see Obama saying over and over again uh, the flat earth, ridiculing them, making jokes about them in his speeches. And I mean, these aren't just off the cuff remarks. These are things that are being written into his, his speeches. So why are they... Why are they doing this? Why are they uh, making sure that people know that the flat earth is something to be ridiculed? <laughs> I agree with you on that. I thought that was pretty hair raising because typical people have to assume that the model of the earth is com as so rock solid that the flat earth idea is so far past that it isn't even on the radar. It shouldn't even be worth mentioning, uh, considering conventional science. So it is rather odd that that is Obama's go to. Like he's talking about how he wants to create progress. And he's like, you know, we can't have every debate. You know, we don't even we don't have time for the Flat Earth Society. And everybody cheers like, yeah, we don't need to have that fundamental of a debate. And, and it just struck me as kind of spooky. If I say that the world is round and someone else says it's flat, that's worth reporting. But you might also want to report on a bunch of scientific evidence that seems to support the notion that the world is round. We don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. They, 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 they must have been founding members of, of the Flat Earth Society. They, they would not have believed that the world was round. <laughs> yeah, definitely.
So you, you've mentioned these Masons, you know, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, um, all the way up to Armstrong, Aldrin, and um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So, I mean, if they're holding this secret, this would be the biggest secret possible. So are you putting uh, Freemasons at the very top layer of this power pyramid? No. Um, Freemasons seem to be the, the foot soldiers who do all the dirty work. But uh, they're definitely part of a grander scheme involving the Vatican and Jesuits and world royalty and other secret societies. So there's, there's definitely a big network. Uh, I don't know. I, I think people like to kind of debate semantics about the tippy top of the capstone of the capstone of the pyramid. And mm. um, I don't know that that there even is uh, such a thing, or if we would ever get to it from the outside. But I think it's definitely, you know, world royalty, the Vatican, the Freemasons, and uh, the whole secret society network of, you know, Bohemian Grove and Skull and Bones and all these other organizations. They're all interlinked in, in some ways through the whole corporate banking, military, industrial structure. You know, the thing's pretty pretty well interwoven. Every country is a tax farm. There's nowhere on earth you can go to get away from paying taxes and obeying government laws, right? So, you know, they make it sound like America and Russia are, are sworn enemies or North Korea or Iran or whatever. They're always giving us boogeymen, but the, the real boogeymen are all the governments and the people who work for governments. They're all mafia organizations in the sense that they couldn't exist and wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the violence and coercion they use to steal tax money from their populations, whether it's a democracy, socialism, communism, fascism, every ism involves taxation, forced stealing money from the population to fund the bureaucracy that continues stealing money and writing laws and imprisoning the population and then making more money off of imprisoning the population as they do in America with the private prisons uh, and uh, profiting off the inmates' labor and whatnot. So they've got a, a big profit margin going here for this, this scheme and it's really well interconnected and to debate about the tippy top all the time as many conspiracists like to do I think it's more important to just see that this is a, a huge network and it en encapsulates literally everything that the conspiracy encyclopedia you know has yeah great points man I, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with that here you talked about well, Antarctica of course being and people going there and getting turned away at gunpoint but what about, say, the early explorers? Do we get any indication that the composition is the way you've described from the early explorers who tried to get down there or tried to sail around Antarctica or anything like that? Yeah, the uh, the early sailors that went to the Antarctic, like um, uh, James Clark and Captain Cook, they spent years trying to find an inlet into the Antarctic ice. On the ball model, it's supposed to be only about 12,000 miles around the Antarctic ice continent. But on the flat earth map, it would be much bigger than that. And in reality, when you sail around it, as I said, it takes three or four years. Uh, and they, were, they weren't going in a straight line, but they were chartering 50 or 60,000 miles around uh, as they were trying to find an inlet into the ice wall, uh, never able, able to find one. Yeah, and you also have, a, and this is another quote that I pulled off your site, a guy named William Carpenter. He says, yes, but we can circumnavigate the South easily enough, is often said by those who don't know. The British ship Challenger recently completed the circuit of the southern region indirectly, to be sure, but she was three years about it and traversed nearly 69,000 miles, a stretch long enough to have taken her six times around the globular hypothesis. Which is interesting because you can then visualize someone trying to get around this island they have in their head, this big island of ice, this big continent of ice, this idea they have in their head. And they're trying to get around it by just going the same direction. And if you picture it in the flat earth model, you can, you can visualize how they would just be bumping into the edge all the way around until they got back to kind of their starting point. And then they'd go back up north and be like where they were. And to them, they think they went around a big continent, but they did exactly the opposite and went 
on the inside of a giant edge. And I thought uh, that quote was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another thing those early uh, explorers found is that they were always outside of their reckoning every day as far as how far they should have traveled uh, on their maps. Uh, so they were an average of 12 to 16 miles, sometimes as much as 29 miles out of reckoning. Uh, Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, commander of the United States Navy Exploration Expedition to the Antarctic uh, in 1838. It's been almost four years going around, and he was uh, writing in his journal how every day he was sometimes up to 20 miles in less than 18 hours out of reckoning. And so they always have to chalk it up to uh, water currents or s some sort of uh, thing like this, but they're consistently out of their reckoning because... The flat Earth, of course, is much bigger in the southern so-called hemisphere than the ball Earth would be. So the maps that they're using are all assuming the ball Earth. They're flat maps, by the way. They use it's called plain sailing is the the most common used navigation method, uh, which is done assuming the water is a plane as it actually is. The natural physics of water proves that the, all the surface of water on Earth is a plane, by the way, because as you know, uh, water will always find and maintain its own level. So if it's dammed up and then released, it will rapidly rush off in all directions until it remains level. Yet they say that we're on a big ball here and the oceans are all convex, uh, somehow you know, held on to the earth through the magical force of gravity, yet we can see with our eyes and we know through physics that water maintains and always is level. Yeah, that's a compelling point. And you did bring up earlier that the horizon always looks flat. And I think most people would say, well, that's a perspective issue. That would be the argument, the typical argument. But if you haven't seen it, people should look at it. That You're right about the idea that there's people who have attached cameras to balloons, just independent people who've attached a high def camera to a balloon, sent it up as high as they possibly could just to get that footage because it is interesting to do. And you are right as far as as far high as it goes on any of these videos that I've seen. I'm a little surprised that you never see a curvature, even thousands of feet up. You don't see that curvature. It's uh, it's a little odd. You'd expect to see it. Yeah, though sometimes you do see curvature, and it's uh, because of using a wide-angle lens. Right. For instance, on the, the uh, Red Bull dives that Felix Baumgartner did that everybody has seen, if you notice, the outside cameras are clearly wide-angle lens, and then there's an inside cockpit camera that isn't. And as you're watching it from the outside cameras, you'll notice that the supposed curvature of the ball earth starts really early on, just, just as he's uh, lifting off. And the exact same curvature, it stays exactly the same all the way up to the point where he's going to jump. So the, the curve is the same, but his altitude has risen by many, many miles. The reason the curve is the same, of course, is because it's a wide-angle lens effect. It's not actually the, the curve of the horizon. It just seems that way. Right. And that's proven by the inside camera, which, as the door opens, you can see the horizon out out the uh, that inside camera. It is it has risen to the eye of the camera, as I said, on a ball earth, you wouldn't open that uh, camera and have the horizon right at eye level uh, in front of you, no matter how big the ball was. That effect can only happen on a flat plane. And you can see in that uh, dive shot that the um, inside camera, the horizon is completely flat. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to the outside and you got a huge curve. But when you're looking at some of the amateur balloon footage, some of it's lens corrected and it's completely uh, flat. And others, uh, like the GoPro stuff, the horizon will fluctuate as the camera spins and tilts. The horizon will go convex and concave. But whenever it's still, uh, it will level off at completely level. And you can see that the convex and concave um, the images are just... Are just uh, a lens effect. It's obviously not the horizon shifting every two seconds as the camera jumps. Yeah. Uh, and when it's still, you can see all the way up, totally flat. Yeah, I, I have a GoPro, so I'm very familiar with that fisheye lens, which, yeah, that's not going to be reliable for what we're trying to to look at. And another thing about that that guy who does the jump from the upper atmosphere, he when he lands, he does a Masonic hand symbol. 
So he very well um, could just be another pawn in the game to create the illusion. I thought that was pretty interesting. Let's see. The, well, another big issue that people are going to have is we're told we have tens of thousands of satellites orbiting the Earth for GPS systems, cell phones, military radar, navigational equipment. How do we rectify that? Yeah. Well, they, and they also say that there's an international space station out there, and there's a, a <laughs> Hubble telescope floating out there taking wonderful CGI Photoshop pictures that they send us back with their amazing 400 mile uh, outer space internet connection to the Hubble Space Telescope. And now the, the, inter the internet space connection has gone to over a million miles with the new Rosetta mission. Have you seen that one? Mm -hmm. The CGI Photoshop pictures from that are just wonderful and well worth the billions of dollars we're spending to get them. <laughs> yeah, so. The, the illusion is that there's a space station and satellites and uh, uh, telescopes just floating out there in infinite space. But you and I know that no matter how high you go, you come right back down. Whatever goes up must come down. The illusion is that at some point, if you go high enough, high enough, this gravity they claim exists that pulls you back down to the Earth suddenly just you pop out of it and into the vacuum of space. Now the vacuum of space can exist because it's connected to the non-vacuum of the atmosphere in Earth and all the other supposed planets that exist. So a vacuum must be a closed system, but they claim space is a vacuum and space is an open system. So it's, imp it's philosophically impossible for, there, for space to be a vacuum. And the way that they fool us into thinking that this actually is plausible is three threefold. First way they do it is in zero G planes, which are Boeing 737s that do parabolic maneuvers that have a free fall illusion, a uh, uh, free fall effect rather that happens for about a minute where you can be floating in these planes. And that's how they get this outer space look like you're floating in outer space. The second way is, uh, through wires, harnesses, and green screen for the longer shots in the ISS, for instance, they do that. And the third way for like the outside shots they do uh, are in pools that are actually underwater. And this is confirmed by the fact that there's bubbles rising in the pool in a lot of their shots. And uh, people on YouTube have dissected a lot of the ISS and other supposed space footage and all the space bubbles that are coming out of their helmets. Some people are even wearing uh, uh, scuba scuba gear. Uh, they found that as well. So that they they fake these uh, zero g illusions by being in water, uh, by being in zero g planes, and by being in harnesses in front of a green screen, and that makes us think that it's possible that out there in space you could just be kind of floating around like they show us in the movies. But as far as we'll ever know, as far as you or I would ever. No, we go as high as we can in a plane or a balloon or a rocket, and we come right back down. Even the rockets they send up, if you're honest about it, you'll notice that they don't go straight up. All their rockets start a parabolic curve, they start to arc over, and the ones they claim are successful are the ones that go out of view before uh, they come all the way back down. And if anybody asks, why do they always curve over like that, they just say that, uh, they're going around the curvature of the ball Earth, and they'll reach escape velocity soon. And at some point, they'll just pop right out of the gravity, and then they'll be floating, which is another problem, because if you were in a vacuum, and you were using rocket thrusters or any, anything to thrust your, yourself forward, you wouldn't go forward or in any direction you wanted to. you just spin wildly out of control like a gyroscope in 360 degrees in three dimensions, spinning wildly. You, you don't go anywhere that way. Um, so the whole idea of space travel is a big joke. It's, it's all science fiction. Yeah, the other thing I thought was really compelling about the satellites is you talk about just go on Google and do an image search for satellites. A lot of the stuff you see is going to look pretty archaic considering modern technology because they've been using the same model for so long. But almost everything, well, a, a, if this model is to be true, it would have to be everything. But everything you see looks CGI or it looks like a little... Uh, computer graphic of a satellite, where are the pictures of Earth with 20,000 satellites orbiting it, orbiting it? If we have an international space station, can't you get a photograph that has all these little dots that should look like lice all around the, 
the Earth's outer atmosphere. That's one issue, but also the temperature. They tell us the thermosphere is 2,000 degrees Celsius. Well, what metal is going to be able to withstand that kind of heat? What computer can, can survive in that environment? Yeah, that's right. Those are two more good points for why satellites, well, we shouldn't just assume that these things exist just because people say they do. Uh, you know, if you want to if you want to be scientific and you want to be a, a real skeptic, uh, you want to be cr a critical thinker, then you should only accept things that you can verify with your senses and with evidence yourself. So, you know, people think it's crazy to believe that satellites don't exist. But really, it's crazy to believe that satellites do exist when you have no evidence and can never verify it for yourself. Just like these space programs and space telescopes and all these other things that we will never confirm. As far as we know, if I go up on a plane and I jump out, I'm coming back to Earth. doesn't matter how high I go. I'm not going to start floating at some point like they claim happens um, and has to happen if there are satellites out there. But as you said, if you look at the pictures of satellites and the pictures that these satellites are supposedly taking, they're all CGI. The satellite itself is fake. The, the uh, pictures of the Earth look like cartoons. Um, they, they claim almost all of them are composites, which is their word. Uh, they say that they receive ribbons of imagery from satellites, which is their term they use to uh, tell us, you know, why we don't just get a friggin' photograph. So they say we get ribbons of imagery and then they have to splice the ribbons of imagery together in Photoshop. So they even claim, uh, they even admit, uh, NASA workers themselves have admitted that they have to use Photoshop uh, on the satellite images. It's just how the data is received. And so, you know, you know, that's how it is, man. <laughs> yeah. NASA's Rob Simmon made this. Simmons' job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is. A composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just hit Command-Z a lot there's artistry to creating the world. What I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. What about, say, Longitude and latitude navigation. How how are we having whole industries of pilots flying around and no one's really catching on? Yeah, I'm, I mean, here's here's a good question. Why don't pilots catch on to this fact? If if the Earth was truly a sphere, twenty five thousand miles in circumference, curvetting eight inches per mile squared, a pilot who wanted to simply maintain their altitude at a typical cruising speed of 500 miles per hour would have to constantly dip their nose downwards and descend 2,777 feet over half a mile every minute. Otherwise, without this compensation in an hour's time, the pilot would find themselves 166,666 feet 31.5 miles higher than expected. You just end up flying off into outer space if you weren't constantly dipping your nose down to fly around the ball. And so like I said, if at the typical cruising speed of most planes, you'd have to be descending a half a mile every single minute. And this never happens. I've talked to pilots. Once you get to your cruising altitude, the artificial horizon maintains level. It don't touch the controls, just keeps on going. And so I mean, the, the reason pilots don't figure I'm sure some pilots figure it out, and then who are they going to tell? Um, I mean, the, they're just like everyone else. Everyone else is so brainwashed that they don't think of it. And if they do, I've even heard some explanations. They, they claim that, uh, you know, they say the, at, the atmosphere 
they say the Earth is spinning over a thousand miles per hour, and that the atmosphere is also dragged along with it. So then, if some pilot says, "Hey, why don't I have to course correct downwards all the time?" Their explanation is that this atmosphere that's being magically dragged with the spinning ball Earth also magically course corrects planes so that they stay at exactly the same altitude uh, because mm-hmm. they're in that that atmosphere, you know, that magical atmosphere that helps you curve around the ball Earth, man. <laughs> <laughs> They've got explanations for everything. Mm-hmm. And like <laughs> we're told that the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles per hour, which is awfully fast, but yet let's say a helicopter cannot just hover in the air for 12 hours, you know, start in St. Louis, Missouri, hover for 12 hours and land in China with the earth spinning below it. And that is what, you know, I would first think would be the situation. But then we're told because we're in the sphere, it all moves relative to itself and you don't notice those changes. And See, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a pilot, and so it's hard for me to really play devil's advocate for their position. But I think about if you're in a speeding car going 90 miles an hour down the highway, you can play catch with the passenger and it feels like you're stationary. Or like if an ant is crawling around on your dashboard, whether it's going with the grain of the car or with or against, it doesn't really notice that effect. So it's like... um you know, I guess I would think that the atmosphere would have the same effect as the encapsulation of that vehicle moving at a fast speed. To the people inside of it, they don't notice. And I guess that's the argument. But do you find do you find flaws with that argument? Yeah, because once again, it's explaining away your common sense and your experience, which is that you're not moving whatsoever. And so they say, oh, yes, you are moving, silly, but you're just moving at a, such a constant velocity that you don't notice it whatsoever. Now, even if you're in the, the best Rolls Royce over the best tar, uh, you know, smoothly going, you close your eyes. I can still tell I'm moving, and that's not going a thousand miles per hour, that's just going 50 or whatever we're, we're talking about here. Even in an elevator, just an elevator going up, I can feel that. I have a, a really sensitive stomach, so I mean, I can tell and I get sick if, uh, you know, if I'm doing some sort of motion that's anything on par with what the Earth is supposedly doing. And so isn't that weird that uh, just because it's a perfect constant velocity that my stomach's able to handle that, but just a, a, a little bit of a elevator malfunction and and then I'm ready to, you know. So these things don't make any sense. They, they just want to explain away your common sense with these kind of arguments. And like you said, if you were in a helicopter, you should be able to just go up, wait for the ball earth to spin underneath you and land at your destination. But of course, the atmosphere spins with the ball earth, so that doesn't happen. But we can prove that that's not the case either because now we have airplanes which you can go easterly or westerly and if the earth and the atmosphere are spinning a thousand miles per hour east all the way all the time as they say then a westbound plane should be well, well an eastbound plane should never reach its destination if it was going 500 miles per hour and the earth is spinning and the atmosphere is spinning a thousand miles, your destination should come up behind you before you ever reach it, right? And then destinations going the opposite way are going to take far, far longer than they, they do. You can check flight times, and they're always within a half hour, hour, a couple hours, whether, no matter what direction you're going to or from. But if the Earth was actually spinning at the rate that they say it was, flight times would be totally different. Hmm. It makes sense, but yet I've been taught from an early age not to trust myself because they've got it on lock. So I just assume that uh, the physics all kind of works out. But I know there are people who go to school for physics. You know, they study it for years and years. And it's just odd that none of them ever catch on to it. That I guess that guys like Newton created this entire fake science around a fake model. And yet all the math checks out. That's a little hard for me to rectify. Well, they're counting on that. That's why they've got all these huge <laughs> formulas and calculations for gravity and whatnot that are based on nothing. So, like, they've got to wait for the ball Earth 
all based on their gravity calculations. And you can Wikipedia, Wikipedia it, and you'll see pages of, you know, mathematic language that makes no sense to 99.9% of the population. But apparently the math works out, so it's real, right? So it's just another way, just like the CGI images or whatever. Some people are fooled by the images. Some people are fooled by the math. Some people are, are fooled by, you know, this or that. They've got many different ways to... Uh, to get us in their grips, like you said, their the whole education system is teaching us not to believe our senses. Like the 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 model they show, the ball earth model with a crust on the outside and the outer mantle and the inner mantle and the outer core and the inner core. Guess what? They've only ever dug eight miles down into the crust, so they don't even know what's beneath that. It took them almost 30 years to get there and they couldn't get any further in the Russian Kola Ultra Deep, it's called. So it's all speculation as to these these layers of the ball earth they claim exist. And it's the inner layer of molten magnetic core, whatever they claim, creates the, um, the magnetism of the earth. And so this is another funny thing. They, they claim that the core that we've never gotten to, uh, so they can't be confirmed existed, causes a uh, magnetic effect on the ball Earth, so that at one point at the top of the ball is a pole, and at the exact opposite point on the ball is an opposite magnetic pole. But this doesn't exist anywhere in nature. You can't find a, a sphere, and at one point on the, the magnetic sphere, it will cause another magnetic sphere to stick to it in that little point and then uh, not and, and then pull, push away from the opposite point. Uh, it doesn't exist like that. Only bar magnets can do that. Um, what do exist, however, are ring magnets and those are shaped just like the flat earth model where the pole is in the middle and then the opposite pole is actually every point along the circumference. So the magnetic explanation, which a lot of people will bring up, well, how does magnetism work if we're on a flat Earth? You know, the accepted model is that it's this spinning molten magnet stuff in the, the core that creates this kind of north-south ball magnet, which doesn't actually exist anywhere in nature. Yet the ring magnet, which is the, it's, it's in loudspeakers and other, other things, uh, that's the flat earth model and that actually does exist. So that's an actual magnet instead of an imaginary magnet like they claim exists. And, the, and we'll actually admit that I don't know what's under the flat earth. We've only gone eight miles down and we haven't gotten to the bottom of the Pacific. Uh, all I know is as far as we can tell, the water is completely flat and the land is flat other than hills, valleys, and mountains over a long period of uh, space. There's no convex or concave curvature. It's totally flat. Yeah. And I guess you could say science is designed exactly how economics and taxes are designed. The increasing complexity makes it so the average individual just has to trust the experts. You can follow it to a certain point, but then most people say, well, that's a little bit beyond me, but there's experts out there. They know what they're doing. Um, I'm sure that this fractional reserve banking system, this debt-based system of rule is just fine. <laughs> you know, um, I'm sure the taxes I'm paying are totally fair. They've got the code. They got the big book. You know, they wouldn't overcharge me. They wouldn't, you know, pull any scams on me. And you could apply the same thing to, of course, science. But it's just to what degree? This is a really far out degree. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, our eyes and experience tell us the earth is flat and motionless and everything in the sky revolves around us. But when we cease to believe our own eyes and experience, we have to prostrate ourselves at the feet of these very pseudoscientists who are blinding us, treat them as experts, astronomical priests who have special knowledge only they can access, like the Hubble telescope. So by brainwashing us of something so gigantic and fundamental, it actually makes every other kind of lesser indoctrination a piece of cake, <laughs> Earth being the flat, fixed center of the universe around which everything in the heavens revolves, gives a special importance and significance not only to Earth, but to us humans, the most intelligent among the intelligent designers' designs. 
by turning Earth into a spinning ball thrown around the sun and shot through infinite space from a godless Big Bang. They turn humanity into a random, meaningless, purposeless accident of a blind, dumb universe. Mm -hmm. So it's like trauma-based mind control beating the divinity out of us with their mental manipulations. Uh, people are always asking, you know, why do they do this? I mean, this is... I mean, other than the obvious profit margin motive, NASA being the biggest black budget black hole in existence, sucking in over $30 billion taxpayer money for the fake moon landings alone. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, hundreds of billions of dollars, and not just NASA, but RASA and all the other fake space organizations around the world giving CGI images for hundreds of billions of dollars. So this modern atheist Big Bang heliocentric globe Earth chance evolution paradigm spiritually controls humanity by removing God or any sort of intelligent design and replaces purposeful divine creation with haphazard random cosmic coincidence. And so by removing Earth from the motionless center of the universe, these masons have moved us physically and metaphysically from a place of supreme importance to one of complete nihilistic indifference. If the Earth is the center of the universe, then the ideas of God, creation, and a purpose for human existence are resplendent. But if the Earth is just one of billions of planets revolving around billions of stars and billions of galaxies, then the ideas of God, creation, and a specific purpose for Earth and human existence become highly implausible. So by surreptitiously indoctrinating us into their scientific materialist sun worship, not only do we lose faith in anything beyond the material, we gain absolute faith in materiality, superficiality, status, selfishness, hedonism, and consumerism. If there's no God and everyone's just an accident, then all that really matters is me, me, me. <laughs> so they've turned Madonna and the mother of God into a, the material girl living in a material world. Their rich, powerful corporations with their slick sun cult logos sell us items to worship, slowly taking over the world while we tacitly believe their science, vote for their politicians, buy their products, listen to their music, watch their movies, all sacrificing our souls at the altar of materialism. <laughs> Touche, my man. <laughs> it's, it's, a big, it's a big deception. I'd say it's the, the biggest cover-up and conspiracy in history. We've been completely deluded for 500 years. Not everybody, but nowadays it's it's pretty it's pretty well advanced. Yeah. Most most of the flat Earth material you'll find still in existence is from the 1800s, and there was there was quite a debate going on then. So there's still quite a few people unconvinced of the ball spinning ball theory back then. But nowadays with NASA and all the the photo and videos that they give us, uh, people don't really look at too much further for evidence as they assume that that's all real. Right. Obviously, it is a huge can of worms and there's so many things, so many arguments. People say, well, what about, you know, the planets? Are the, the planets are all fake? Yeah, there's a lot of things that our science has told us that are built off of the heliocentric model that they've given us. And I think that if there's any unanswered questions by the time we're done here, if people go online and take their question and they look it up on either the comment section of your website or I was I was very surprised to see how many people really are questioning the heliocentric model online. I thought it would be far less. But if you take the question you may have and you uh, ask it to the the so-called experts on the idea, they will have an answer for you. Um, and I guess I would say challenge yourself to try to stump one. Challenge yourself to try to come up with something that they can't explain and then say it's bullshit. But until then, maybe you should uh, keep an open mind. And before we do go too far into it, give us a clear mental picture, if you can, of what you consider the true model of the Earth and the cosmos and this whole thing to be, because obviously we're calling in the question that there, there are not billions of stars, there are not a bunch of planets in the solar system orbiting the sun. That's a huge ball of wax. So what is this reality? How is it structured? So if you look up at the sky with, with your eyes or with a telescope, you can't tell the difference between a star and a planet. The planets were always known as wandering stars and the regular stars as fixed stars for thousands of years. Uh, nowadays, they claim that planets are Earth-like spherical terra firma that you can walk on out up there in outer space. But as far as you can tell through any telescope that we have, it's just a round dot of light up there in the sky. All the planets and all the stars, none of them can be confirmed to be some sort of 
terra firma that you could land on, though in their pictures from their fake telescopes, they clearly look like big ball planets that you could definitely land on, as they show you with Mars and whatnot. But that can't be confirmed, again, with your own eyes or with a telescope that you could buy. With anything that we can see, the sun, moon, stars, and planets are all just lights in the sky revolving around us. They claim that we revolve around the sun, and the moon revolves around us, and the stars are actually distant suns trillions upon trillions of miles away. Now, this wasn't always that way. They've actually been reverse engineering these explanations as they go along, because geocentric flat earthers throughout the centuries have come up with good objections, such as Tycho Brahe's objection that if the earth is a ball spinning around the sun, in six months' time, we should be 200 million miles on the other side of the sun. So the parallax perspective, when you look through a telescope uh, in your backyard, you can prove this, you should see some difference in the stars after 200 million miles of supposed orbit. Uh, but you can't see any whatsoever. So what people have, uh, what uh, heliocentrists have been saying since then is that the stars are actually, the, the nearest star is 25 trillion miles away, 4.2 light years. They came up with a sci-fi term to make it seem plausible. It's light years away, it's so far away that even after 200 million miles, you can't see an inch of difference in your backyard through a telescope after six months of supposed orbital motion. Um, the reason that they say the ball Earth is tilted on its vertical axis 23.5 degrees is because you can see Polaris, the North Pole star, all the way to 23.5 degrees south latitude. And if the Earth was a ball, you couldn't see that because you'd be staring through the ball to look up at that star. Um, you can see it on the f because the Earth is flat, of course, uh, but you can't see all the stars in at any one place from the Earth because of the law of perspective. That's why the sun seems to rise and fall in the, the sky every day as well, but it's actually not rising or falling anywhere. The sun and the moon maintain their altitude and they revolve circles around the flat earth. So we're, we're, we're stationary. The sun and the moon are actually the same size just as they appear. There's another lie. They claim that the sun is 400 times bigger and 400 times further away than the moon. Uh, and that's that's why they just appear the same size from our perspective, but they're not. But I mean, again, with your own eyes, you can see when they eclipse, they are the same size. And the fact that they do eclipse is not quite a coincidence to happen on a Big Bang accident universe uh, that everything is just spinning around in space randomly. How come there's these two brilliant lights in the sky that pass each other and they're perfectly opposite? Do you know the, the sun's light is very different than the moon's light too? They claim the moon the moon's light comes from the sun, it's reflected off of the sun. But if you collect the moon's light, it's actually cold. Whereas if you collect sunlight, of course, it's hot and you can burn things. The sunlight will preserve uh, certain things, dry out meat, meats and things to eat. But if you leave meats out in the moonlight, they spoil. Um, if you're in the, the shade in the sunlight, the shade is obviously the temperature is going to be less. But if you're in the shade in the moonlight, the temperature is more. If the moonlight is cold. I've never noticed that. I'm going to try that out. Yeah. The combustion in a bonfire is increased by moonlight and it's decreased by sunlight. There's another one. So there's a lot of things that prove that the sun and the moon are actually their own lights. Uh, they're not, the, the moon is not a big ball up there in space that you can land masons on, as they claim. It's just a light, a, a flat round disk. And you can even see through the moon during waxing and waning cycles. The Royal uh, Astronomical Society, even the, the people who are uh, part of this manipulation, they've recorded several times that you can see stars and planets through the moon. And the, the astronomers that are seeing it, they're always flabbergasted about how this is possible. But it's because the moon is not physical. It's not densely physical in the way that they claim. It's just a light. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see through it. Uh, just like the planets. The planets as well are just lights. That's, that's why Pluto is not a planet anymore, because the, the light from it just rapidly diminished one day, and they couldn't continue fooling all the amateur astronomers that Pluto's a planet, because the starlight from it just <laughs> diminished by 50%.
I, I think that moon thing is pretty compelling. I am going to tonight see if that's true. I've never noticed that effect. I've never looked for that effect. But to think that if I get into the shade of the moon and that the moon is giving off its own light, I mean, that is pretty radically different. And I like those kind of challenges. So I'm going to try to see how that works. But I'm surprised more people haven't stumbled upon that. If the moon is giving off a cold light... I guess we just assume it's the absence of sunlight, but to shade yourself from that and be warmer, hmm. Interesting indeed, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I don't know, man. This is about as far out as it gets, and it's super awesome. So, you know, thanks for being here. We covered so much ground. I think we made a pretty good, complete case for at least the proponents of the flat earth i think they would be proud of the of the interview we did today but you know if there are still skeptics out there that are resistant to this idea is there anything else before we wrap this up that we should mention as icing on the flat earth cake or anything <laughs> yeah i recommend everybody look into it do your own research and uh yeah check out my website atlanticconspiracy.com my book and documentary is free on youtube the flat earth conspiracy and i've just restarted the international flat earth research society uh, you can come see uh, some of the message board stuff we're doing over there at ifers.boards.net Perfect, man. And uh, I did want to mention also real quick, for people who are going to go look this stuff up, you might want to avoid the Flat Earth Society because they seem to be controlled opposition. You have a post about that, how the Flat Earth Society, the official group, they purposely sound crazy. They purposely don't answer things correctly. And when you trace back some of the people who are involved, they are Masons as well. So it seems like they might have this group set up to look stupid. Maybe avoid that. Exactly. The Flat Earth Society was, yeah, the Flat Earth Society was set up uh, after the International Flat Earth Research Society was set up as the controlled opposition to uh, bring people away from, from that society. Uh, uh, Charles K. Johnson, who uh, ran that society, he had his house burned down and all of his Flat Earth material was burned in the fire. And he claimed to his dying day that it was done by a NASA agent who also tried to murder him. Um, and so, yeah, the Flat Earth Society, w what they do is they mix a bunch of false Flat Earth arguments in so that people who are uh, considering the Flat Earth and trying to research it, they'll instantly come upon the Flat Earth Society material because it's at the top of the, all the search engines. And, and they'll have false arguments like um, instead of saying that gravity doesn't exist, as, as we got into a little bit, um, they'll say gravity exists, but it's explained by the Flat Earth disk constantly rising up 9.8 meters per second. And so, you know, you can imagine instead of you falling, the flat earth is rising up and that's what happened. Right. But um, again, this is, this is a silly argument. If, if that was the case, then sustained flight would be impossible and the flat earth would be rising up into planes and helicopters and stuff crashing into them. So they present an easily refutable argument like this and then well-meaning researchers trying to look into the flat earth find their frequently asked questions that has these uh, bad answers and then they just think oh well, this is this is ridiculous and they also uh, they, they make the whole thing into this big satire and they, they address it cynically so if you read some of their threads they don't they don't keep a, a serious research kind of attitude they're always off the cuff trying to be witty and funny all the time so the the whole thing is just made into a mockery yeah. they even made a mockumentary called in search of the edge and, and they'd show it to uh, people in public schools uh, they'd show it to kids and then afterwards they'd ask them if they believed it and then if if the kids believed it they'd then give these worksheets showing why uh, it was wrong and that the earth definitely isn't flat and here's why and then they'd start a big ball earth unit based on it so uh, the flat earth society has been involved in these kind of fake flat earth arguments and documentaries and everything from there yeah. from the get-go <laughs> up until today so yeah so stay clear of the flat earth society and come on over to the international flat earth research society yeah just like alex jones makes conspiracy theorists seem crazy they have an organization set up to make flat earthers seem crazy so it's definitely worth a mention because i didn't want people to go there and then get turned off like you said it's usually the first thing they see so atlanteanconspiracy.com Check out Eric's awesome YouTube page. It's got tons of this stuff that has made me question a lot of things I thought I knew. But thanks so much, man. You really have 
changed my impression of flat earthers, even if I might not have become one myself quite yet overnight. I love the fringe ideas like this. I just didn't think there was a real argument there, and now I think there could be. So keep doing what you do and take care of yourself out there, man. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. It was a good interview.